This is Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 166, The History of Weight Watchers. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie, I run RegainWellness.com, and this is the Regain Wellness Podcast. Sorry about that dial-up internet intro. I just thought we had to go back to our roots there. I was just like, I recorded in this amazing studio, and it's like they're wiring it now, like our area for 5G internet, which is so fast it's almost like it's not in yet but it's so fast it's almost like unthinkable how quick this will be i don't know if you've seen like what 5g will be like but it's like full like hd video movies like downloaded in a second and i'm looking at this while i'm like on my phone i'm thinking how accessible and easy everything is online now compared to um if you if you recognize that sound at the beginning you know what i'm talking about if you didn't you're obviously under 23 or 24 who knows but that was how we used to do it so this is um an episode i don't for some reason in some last episodes i was recording i i kept bringing up this idea or referring to weight watchers for whatever reason i think it was connected i was talking about like big fitness movements as far as things like crossfit and i did an episode on f45 fitness and i was just talking about like big mainstream things and i think i just referenced weight watchers and then I remembered like what a huge movement and business and community and like culturally relevant thing Weight Watchers has been. And then I like look more in the history and it's actually pretty interesting like how it's developed and grown and everything like that. So I thought like an episode devoted to it. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. I did um, just going through a lot of the information and background and everything. So I used to do some little like seminar things at weight Watch- weight watchers groups in my city they're obviously all over but the like i really so i i've seen it sort of firsthand and i like really did like the community and the sort of the culture they they've built so i think it's just interesting to have a look at so that's what we'll do here today so i also thought it was relevant because in the last well, i mean depending when you listen to this but recently they've they've sort of rebranded themselves and they're now known as WW International and with uh, not that there wasn't a focus on wellness, but sort of going that way as opposed to making it strictly just Weight Watchers, but it's always going to be known as that. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I just, it's, I don't know, like at their core, just trying to, you know, reinvent it. I mean, rebranding and branding in general is so big. So now it's like a different logo. It's a two W two white W's on top of each other in a blue circle. So I don't know, just making more of a a fresh approach or whatever. This was in September of 2018. So, but at its core, it's still Weight Watchers. So it's American company, even though it's around the world now and based around offering various products, services, they insist in weight loss. They assist in weight maintenance, um, I have no connection to this at all. This is just me passing on information for the record. So started in 1963 in Queens, in New York, by a homemaker named Gene Nidech. And now it's grown to about, I think it's like in 30 countries around the world. And there's different local translations of it. And all their materials are, are translated to the local area and, you know, working around what's available to them and foods available and everything like that. So that, but the core philosophy behind the company's programs and always has been is to use a a science driven approach to help, you know, its participants lose weight by forming helpful habits, learning to eat smarter, to obviously get more exercise, to be more educated. And ultimately like the big thing, is provide support among their members. And with all like, you know, 
great inventions. It, it's it was more about finding a solution. I mean, that's kind of the secret behind any um, creation invention is identify a problem and provide a solution, it, no matter what it is. So in the case of Jean Nittich, and I saw different stuff. She's either from Brooklyn or Queens, which is a huge difference if you're familiar with the boroughs and everything, and you don't want to tie it down just to New York. So either way, well, in that area. So like when she decided to lose weight, she tried – and there's always been fad weight loss programs. They've, they've existed from like day one, you know, they go back a century plus, but so she had tried various fad programs. Um, but then she eventually lost 20 pounds following a New York city board of health sponsored diet. And obviously was happy with that when she, when she found it was getting difficult to keep pushing herself, she wanted to create a support group with other friends of hers who wished to like also lose weight as well. She, you know, she did well initially, but it was, it's, you know, fitness and health and everything can be sort of an isolated experience. And I've talked about this a lot. I think it's why these bigger programs have grown as far as in, in the fitness world, like CrossFit probably being number one. And then this episode I did on F45 fitness, which was one of the fastest growing um, fitness movements as well, along with like other things like, Orange Theory Fitness or Soul Cycle, like if people want more of this community aspect from, you know, what, even just from a social um, experience, like that's their, you know, like you're not going out to bars. This is your way to socialize and interact, but as well as that support group, encouragement, everything like that. So that, that was just basically her idea. She wanted to like lose weight with friends, um, but keep each other, you know, accountable and motivated and everything like that. So and then she was she was 40 when she started this in 1963. So this isn't like some young kid with a tech startup like today where entrepreneurs can only be like it seems like 18 years old. So, you know, even back then, which was tougher to sort of launch anything and you know, kind of develop and promote a program with if you think how hard, you know, communication and stuff like that would have been back then. So pretty amazing how it grew into this like worldwide um like globally known brand. Okay. So how it works and you know, it hasn't even strayed much from this over the years, but it's core approach. Like I said, is to assist members in losing weight through eating more healthily, getting more exercise and then keeping them accountable and supported while they do it. So the primary diet plan is it has really no directly comparable requirements and, and technically no food is off limits because you know, they work around the point systems and stuff like that. And it's still, but it's still based around creating a calorie deficit. Um, It's, it's generally compatible, like compatible with other diet approaches and or food. You know, if you have allergies or intake restrictions, things you have to avoid or whatever, but it it still provides its participants um, who use their, you know, their framework to still measure and limit the qual uh, the quantity of food consumed while you know you whatever your diet plan like say you're gluten free or you're doing paleo or whatever so that's going to dictate the foods you're going to eat but when you use the weight watchers framework you're still able to measure and kind of um keep track of the amount and quantity that you're taking in so it were it, that that's probably why it still survived to this day as a lot of Diet fads have come and gone and, and still like healthy eating approaches that are, are very good, like whether you follow like a Mediterranean diet per se, or if you're going like a full alkaline diet to you just don't like. So, you know, what like whatever it is, whether it's like you just feel you need to follow it or you actually have to physically follow a certain diet and avoid different things, it still all works within their framework. So the way it's working now, as I talk about the modern um, ability to communicate and connect online. That's the two ways it works, whereas opposed it was based on in-person meetings. And now it's expanded, obviously, into big online-only programs. But again, the both programs are still using the same basic materials. They're still using the same formulas, computations for whatever. So in for in-person meetings, Weight Watchers encourages members to select a goal weight and they use like that they you know they try to base it around a, a getting a body mass index 
of a healthy range. And healthy is considered, if you know the BMI around 18 to 24.9, just under 25, that, that's a whole complicated thing, the BMI. Um, you know, and a lot of fitness people aren't big fans of it because it really doesn't give you a true indicator of what's going on in your body. And it's just more of a calculation. It doesn't take into um, a, a, um, consideration like, say, amount of lean muscle mass. So people who are high level athletes with a lot of muscle mass, but at a certain height can be considered obese on the body mass index, but they're, they're, they're world class athletes. So the thing, it it's more the body mass index is used as sort of like a quick, um, I don't know if you heard me snap there, a quick <clears throat> kind of uh, fast way to give you a starting point and a tracking point and seeing where you are <clears throat> and where you go from there. If you think like for doctors and physicians, they're so busy and there's so many people coming through that it's it's just like a quick snapshot, like boom, boom, plug this in and get people on their way. So whether it's out of laziness or it's the most effective thing with time constraints, considering how long actual, like when you look at breaking down lean muscle mass to body fat to true body fat measurements, it's a long process and can take a while compared to BMI, which is like boom, bang, out the door. So, I mean, that's got its issues with it. So, I mean, that's, you know, they're, they're selecting goal weight based around this healthy BMI index. So, but like, although a member may also establish a goal weight outside that range, you know, cause that will be successful to them. And, you know, they, they, you can even come in with a doctor's note that says, you know, for this person, they can be healthy, even though technically they're in a higher BMI range that might consider them overweight or obese or whatever. So there's actually in, in the U S anyway, in, to join Weight Watchers, you must weigh at least five pounds. That's like 2.3 kilograms more than the whim, the minimum weight considered healthy by the company for their height. So again, it goes into that ba- the body mass index thing and you have to come in um, at the, the sort of requirements to join it. So once a member reaches their goal weight, then they go into a maintenance period. So for the following six weeks after that, the member you know, the, they gradually adjust their food intake until the member no longer loses or gains weight. And, you know, they kind of stick with that. And if at the end of that six week, um, you know, the different weigh-ins, like, I don't know if you've never, if you haven't seen these before, like with the groups and the meetings, the in-person ones, you do weigh-ins and they announce, you know, how that person's done that week. And then everyone's there to applaud or support or encourage or whatever. So um, if at the end of that, those six different weigh-ins during the maintenance period, the member weighs in within two pounds of their goal weight, they can become what's called a lifetime member. So it's, you know, it's, it's not like a quick one and done. Weight Watchers is, is meant for sort of the long haul here. And that's been part of their success behind it. So when we're talking about the online approach, they, the Weight Watchers e-tools, it's, uh, it's a web-based service for members and it includes access to support materials. They got those tracking tools and in some areas, Weight Watchers meetings are operated by one of the locally franchised organizations uh, rather than what's considered Weight Watchers International, which is like the over and governing body or whatever like that. But you can have these little smaller franchises and then they're sort of their job or they have the ability to find the people in their area who are doing the online version and then they can still get together. And that's, that's one of the great things about our modern era and the internet in general is that you can always find like-minded people. And if you think like, if you grew up without this, if you like some people live in a world where they've always just known the internet and, but if you grew up without it, and you had like specific interests, like you liked um, obscure comic books or European, like English old comedies. And, but like you couldn't find people who share that same thing. But like with the internet, you can find these like-minded groups and connect with these people. And that's one of the advantages with modern health and fitness is there's so many amazing communities and groups online where people can get 
together and connect with these people you've either never met, whether it's like, I'm not going to say any specific names because there's so many different online ones I think are amazing. I don't want to like put ones above the other and they, whether it's like they're online, um, you know, within their website, like their own chat room things or Facebook groups or whatever, these people are finding people on the same journey as them who can support and encourage and they can turn to and keep them accountable. And that that's an amazing thing to me. And then as much as that's grown, people again, though, are, you know, like loving the miracle of being able to do everything online and, um, almost being like anonymous through it, but eventually people still miss that human interaction. So these online places have turned into these meetups and you see it a lot with people. If you follow like certain YouTubers or online health personas and everything was like about the online community and now they're getting more into these actual real meetups and retreats and conferences and people want that social dynamic and connection. So it's kind of coming back around again. So that's what, has been good with uh, Weight Watchers is they've like embraced that, but still kind of stuck to their roots and uh, and everything. So in a lot of locations, Weight Watchers holds meetings um, for their members, which is even just based around like positive, positive reinforcement for people, not even like the nuts and bolts of the weight loss and whatever. They'll have these meetings just to like, um, kind of open forums and to help people work through things. So it, it's depending on what your needs are, it, it's been able to help um, meet a lot of that. And it, and it goes back now to obviously, uh, if you don't know, like Oprah, Oprah Winfrey owns a huge stake in that. And then that, that's always been her thing as well, too, is working through, you know, it's not just about um, the weight issue. There, there There's something maybe behind it. And it's sort of like, peeling back the layers and, and that's been her thing as well. And like her platform and she's been helping, she's been good for helping people to realize that, to like look a little more inward and a little deeper and, and Weight Watchers has been able to take that approach as well too. So the original plan has uh, changed and adjusted over the years. So the, the founder, Jean Nittich, she wrote a book in the early seventies called the memoir of a successful loser, the story of Weight Watchers. And that documented the original Weight Watchers plan. And, that original plan was um, supplanted shortly after the book with materials from um, another book called Weight Watchers Program Handbook for Ladies. And then by 1989, the plan had switched to what they call an exchange-based diet. And they that that went on for a little while. Like you could, so it evolved into the point system, which a lot of people are familiar with. And if you've seen in grocery stores and whatever over the years, you know, packaging would include points on it is, you know, Weight Watchers was kind of integrated with a lot of foods and whatever. And you could see how many points this would be or per serving or whatever. So that was 1997 in April, 2005, the, you know, you're getting to the end of the low carb kind of Atkins era, you know, that depending when you think that started, that's been around for decades really, but it really, I think through the two thousands, early two thousands, that was, at the forefront, but it, it's sort of to like sputter out the low carb fad. And they, uh, there was, you know, a bit, they changed up some licensing deals with different products and food. <clears throat> and they had, uh, worked with brands. I think it's called cool brands was one of their things, you know, like there was a lot, they were trying to like jump on the bandwagon with, and they just didn't want to be, they kind of like pulled themselves away from all that low carb Atkins sort of stuff as it was um, people were maybe starting to see like this isn't an ideal approach or the fad was just ending. So in 2015, Weight Watchers created a, like a bit, you know, a rebranding again campaign, which has happened also now in 2018. And they work with an ad agency. And then they started really, you know, they, if you remember these commercials at all, they, they actually featured real people and real members in them. And they started de-emphasizing counting calories, which had always been a part of everything. And they moved more into what they call the freestyle program, which isn't any hip hop related thing, but it's more about identifying the overall healthy, like healthfulness of a food as opposed to like the calories. So it's identifying what's the healthiest choice 
and then they created a smart points program. If you, the calorie issue is such a mess anyway and calorie math and all that. And I recommend you listen to an episode with a guest. I did a New York times bestselling author called Jonathan Baylor wrote a book called the calorie myth. And I won't go into as much now, but it's just about how that whole thing is really not an effective way to count cal. If this is something you've done before, it's just to, it's not that it's, some people just like to track everything and they want to know calories and that's just, you know, that's just different personality types and whatever, but to, to actually, to be sort of locked into this idea that there's a calorie math, like if I eat this, that means I'll lose this to the, you know, it's, it, it, it's quite much more complicated than that. So listen to that episode. If you go to, you can just search it up, but if it's, if you want to look for it quicker, it's just, if you go to the show notes for today's episode, so it's regainwellness.com slash 166, I'll like anything I'm talking about, I'll link up there. So I'll put that episode with Jonathan and uh, yeah, I, I recommend listening to that. It really change your perception on the whole calorie issue. So like I'll touch more on how that this point system used to work with their calorie idea and how it is now. So as of now, it's this smart points called, and they call it like smart points beyond the scale. Sounds like a action movie. It, so it's like, it's trying to help people make smarter food choices build better relationships with food and still kind of using a points based plan. You know, every food and drink is assigned a points value and all that sort of thing. And that's kind of been at the core of what they do. So smart, smart points is calculated using calories, uh, saturated fat, sugar, and protein. And like I said, no food is off limits, but the plan now assigns higher points values to foods higher in sugar or saturated fat or trans fats or, or whatever. And then they give a lower point value to like lean proteins and things like vegetables and a lot of fruits are zero points. So you can eat as much as of those as you want. And that's similar to how the old points plan worked. And even some like, just like random things like ketchup used to be uh, like zero points, but now there's like, you know, a lot of ketchups are actually just huge amounts of sugar. So those are no longer free points as, as they call them. So like before this, before the smart points plan, when they used what was called points plus, and that was um, more introduced in 2010. And f- what they were saying was it, they incorporated a decade of, of science of, of research compared to the, what used to be just a normal points plan. So the points plus pan plan the focus was on assisting members in creating a calorie deficit to lose weight using a new calculation approach and they their old one was like a very very simple plugged in you just taking the straight up numbers now they're using like well this was in 2010 they're using total fat total carbohydrates dietary fiber and protein and this change from the old point system was, you know, the identi- identification of power foods. They called them and assigning. F- this is when they put fruits and vegetables to, and w- most of them to have a points value of zero. And the uh, points plus was calculated using again total fat, carbohydrate, dietary fiber, and protein. And then they had these alternatives to the points plus plan where people could use what they called simply the simply filling technique. And on that technique, you would eat from a designated list of foods without the requirement to track. So categories of foods on that list were, again, like most vegetables, a lot of fruits, um, some whole grains, some nonfat dairy, dairy substitutes, lean proteins, and you know a few other items. So because that plan did not require tracking, participants needed to be more mindful to eat portions that feel right for them, that they felt would make them feel full and would help them avoid overeating. Um, not, not so much that they would feel too full and not that they would feel too hungry. And then and this, so you can see how this would be even more complicated for a lot of people. Like they're like, well, how do I know if this is going to fill me up as much or, I normally don't eat these foods together. If I'm eating this at this time, well, I, you know, it's, it's very arbitrary and whatever. And I think their approach is better now that it's identifying the highest quality foods. And, and this goes back to the, 
the calorie myth with Jonathan Baylor. And he talks about your body, as long as you're feeding it real whole foods and you're, you know, you're, you're making an emphasis on getting like double digit servings of non starchy vegetables each day, eating like the cleanest proteins you can find, uh, focusing on healthy fats, um, you know, like olive oils, avocados, nuts and seeds, getting like good citrus fruits in and berries. It's at this point, like your body knows how to handle real whole foods. Like your body doesn't know calories. I mean, actually no one really knew calories till 30, 40 years ago, but when they started to become relevant, I mean, your, your grandparents or great grandparents, they're aware of them, but like they didn't have food values and they ate very little packaged food and there wasn't indicators of calorie content. Your body's able to manage, um, you know, as long as you're providing it with real whole foods, it knows how to balance things off and it knows how to maintain it. I mean, your body's, the, your body's survived like this for millennia because of it. And this, if this mechanism wasn't in place, we, we wouldn't be here right now. So as long as it's based around real whole food and that you're focusing on nourishing yourself and providing nutrients and not starving yourself and whatever, your body can do the rest. It's when you start throwing in all the other crap and fake foods and artificial foods and refined grains and sugars and high fructose corn syrup and alcohol and uh, like artificial sweeteners. That's when everything gets out of whack. Cause now your body has no idea what's being thrown at it and it can't manage it perfectly. You know, your body's, if you remember, you know, back to high school and homeostasis and balance, your body strives to seek balance and it can do that provided it's being fed the right whole things all the time. Um, so like I like that approach now that they're focusing on the quality and the health factor of the foods. So I'll get into just some other random things about the whole company that I think are interesting. That that's sort of it in a nutshell. And I think, you know, the reason it survived over the decades is all those things I mentioned before, but it is been um um, like a mainstream, well, everyone knows Weight Watchers. And I think that's because there's been a lot of celebrity involvement. I'd say like Oprah being the biggest one, she'd always advocated for it and, you know, found her success through it, you know, to the fact or to the point now that she owns, I think she owns like 10% of the company or whatever, even though she could own probably every company on earth at this point. Um, and I'm not even sure how much 10% of the whole thing is, but whatever. She's got money for days. They've had other famous people. I'd say if you remember Sarah Ferguson, Fergie, the non-black eyed peas Fergie was big on it. I don't know if that's like in the later eighties or nineties. They've had other actresses like Lynn Redgrave, Jenny McCarthy, Jessica Simpson was really big on it for a while. And uh, Jennifer Hudson, if you remember her, I don't know if she's still around. I'm sure she is somewhere. They, so they were big on it too. And that, you know, that obviously helps. Actually, I forgot about this one. Charles Barkley, NBA legend, was involved with that and even did some promotions and whatever. I think he lost something like 40 pounds. And that was his whole thing. Like it wasn't just for women. And they sort of made this direction like to target men as well too. And and that was, you know, how he was involved with it. He's like, men don't talk about dieting and losing weight, but they should. And, you know, it's better if you've got people around you who can keep you motivated. So that was, you know, them trying to kind of hit every, you know, market and demographic they can. So just, yeah, like I said, some other random things. So if you're, you know, it's like, like almost 50 years after it began, you can find a Weight Watchers meeting pretty much anywhere in the United States, obviously, where it was based out of, but like I said, it's a worldwide thing. It's here all over Canada, and like I've been able to see them and, you know, do quick little talks with them and stuff like that. They are, like, they're in, what, 30 different countries, Brazil, France, South Africa. You, you like, if you're traveling, you can drop in on any of these meetings. If you're in New Zealand, you can swing by and jump on in. So total, they've got more than 36,000 meetings a week that are always constantly going on that have the same direction and same mindset and, and same approach to help everybody. And it's actually, so what we got here, it has Weight Watchers has more members than most major, major cities have residents. And that's what I mean. Everyone knows there's over a million members at, 
at the moment. And that's, um, you know, that's what, that's a population of San Francisco. Um, what else do we have here? They've got, it was in 2015, it was ranked the number one weight loss program of that year. And that was ranking done by us news. And they're looking at, they, they do these every year. They talk about the best and the worst diets. And this year, I forget what it was. I think it was, um, I don't know if it was like ketogenic diet was the worst compared to the med. I don't know. Like it's always like whatever, but as of that year, you know, even decades after, like they, there's a panel of health and nutrition experts that look through it and they look at their, uh, its effectiveness, uh, the health risks, the ease, and it was still ranked number one. So it's managed to survive through all these different crazy food fads and, you know, changes in approaches and what foods are now being considered like outlawed compared to what's are embraced. And it goes up and down and Weight Watchers is still made it through there and still very profitable. And they make, uh, I think they take in, I think something like 30 plus million a year consistently and still growing. So that's probably a good place to end it there. <laughs> Hopefully you've, I find this interesting. Hopefully you're just, you know, if you're very well aware of Weight Watchers or you've been a part of it, you know, this might not be new to you, but like if you've just had an interest sort of from a, a distance just to see what's gone behind it. So I'd like to thank Oprah and um, everyone else involved. So that's it. Thanks for checking the show out. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to it. We're probably on Apple Podcasts, but basically wherever you find podcasts, this show should be there. So make sure you sign up to get it and then check out the show notes for uh, checking, you know, the different episodes I mentioned. So reganwellness.com slash 166. While you're there, sign up for the email newsletter because you get a free ebook when you sign up for that. And it's a quick breakdown on, you know, foods you want to be avoiding, foods you want to be including. It's got some recipes, whatever. So that, if you're on the website, is reganwellness.com slash guide. And then I, and it's, you know, emails I send out every few weeks and information I basically just share over email. So check that all out. And that's it for me. I'll see you later.